There is a world unlike our world. A world in which legends live and die. Where magic and technology vie for dominion. And where mysteries buried for a thousand years have now been uncovered to catastrophic effect. This is the world of Io. It is a world of the Aline, mystics who build the strength of their kingdom on the elements of sand, flame, and glass. It is a world of the Quaddle, a jungle empire that commands a strange power unknown to outsiders. And it is a world of the Vinci, the industrious masters of steam and clockwork, who rely on ingenuity and industry to realize their ambitions. While the Vinci are, in the present age of Io, the masters of industry and technology, much of their striving is directed inward, as the Vinci city-states are at best a loosely connected affiliation of uneasy alliances. At worst, they are a network of bitter enemies, unified only by their methods of destruction. It doesn't seem that the Vinci were always like this, however, as their past points to a civilization that was once a united empire. Unfortunately, much of their history has been lost along the road of industrialization. Remnants of the previous Vinci Empire are scattered across the territories of the present-day city-states. No effort appears to be made to preserve these ruins, as the Vinci seem content to build their new structures of metal and steam atop them. In other cases, the ruins are destroyed, as groups of Vinci renegades and condottieri mercenaries dig mines to access deep deposits of Timonium, the most valuable resource on Io. Given this lack of information, we can only discern a general idea of the Vinci's history. In the past, the Vinci civilization was a unified empire, albeit one that was less technologically advanced compared to the present-day city-states. While there were always individual Vinci with a mind for invention, the empire's technological progress advanced at a slow pace. That was until one Vinci, known as the Great Inventor, emerged. Not much is known regarding the Great Inventor, not even his name, but he is regarded as the one responsible for pioneering the steam and clockwork technology enjoyed by the present Vinci civilization. The rapid adoption of the Great Inventor's inventions in such a short time span ultimately led to the breakup of the Empire. Each major city, or province, declared independence from the Empire, whose leaders were slow to adopt the technological changes sweeping the land. In the end, the remnants of the Empire were transformed into loosely joined bands of condottieri mercenaries. While powerful despite their lack of technology, the condottieri are constantly at war with one another, which keeps them occupied and disorganized, a situation that benefits the now well-established Vinci city-states, some of whom are more than capable of building their own militaries for defense and conquest. Perhaps the most well-known conflict of the Vinci was the war between the city-states of Miana and Venucci. The two city-states had always been rivals, especially in regards to advancements in science and engineering. Both had substantial influence over neighboring city-states, who often functioned as vassals. The war would end up spanning across all the Vinci lands. While Miana would technically be the victor of the conflict, it was a Pyrrhic victory since the city itself would be raised by the Doge of Venucci as a final act of destruction while fleeing Vinci lands with his remaining army. Sixteen Vinci city-states emerged in the wake of the old empire's dissolution. One of the most prosperous of these states was Miana. At one time, Miana was the home of the great inventor himself. The city came under attack by an army of the Dark Aline, led by the genie called Sawu. Hailing from the Kalahisi Desert, this army made its way west through the Cilian Pass and laid siege to Miana. The Great Inventor led the defense of the city, but despite the Vinci's technology, it wasn't enough to hold back the dark forces of the Aline army. 
The Great Inventor made his last stand at the bridge leading into the Vinci City. Sawu, believing his victory inevitable, ordered his forces to charge across the bridge. Thinking quickly, the Great Inventor overloaded the capacitors of his destroyed walker, resulting in an explosion so powerful that it destroyed the bridge, preventing Sawu's forces from capturing the city at the cost of his life. With no means to effectively enter Miyana, and now lacking the forces needed to capture the city, the Dark Alin fell back to the desert. Though they had lost the man responsible for the technology that now makes up the cornerstone of their civilization, his work and ingenuity continued to live on in the hearts and minds of the Vinci people, with new generations growing up surrounded and inspired by the works of the great inventor. One of these Vinci would be Giacomo, who himself grew up in the city of Miana, and would later go on to become a great man in his own right. When Giacomo was a child, his father was the lord of Miana, and when his father passed away years later, Giacomo's brother, Petruzzo, would lead the city-state. After his brother's untimely death at the hands of the Doge of Minucci, Giacomo would become leader of Miana, and vowed to exact vengeance on the Doge for murdering his brother. Within the state's territory was Miana Station, where railroads from surrounding Vichy lands converge. The station was hastily built atop ruins of the Last Empire, these rail lines connect sundry neutral sites, but most importantly, they serve to link the distant mining companies which control most of the Timonium in the region. At the end of the Great Miana Venucci War, the city would be destroyed by Doge Alessadri, as he marched his remaining military forces through the Cilian Pass into the Kalahisi Desert. This action prompted the surviving Mianans, along with other Vinci troops led by Giacomo, to pursue the Doge into the desert. To the southwest of Miana is its vassal state, Padonia. Trusting their defense to a treaty with Miana and protection money paid to Parada, the people of Padonia prefer to focus on internal affairs. Much of the Padonian economy comes from the Walker factories in the southern lowlands. At one time, Padonia had become plagued by a band of Dark Alin raiders led by a genie named Marwan. These Dark Alin constantly harassed caravans along the road spread across the state. Only with help from Miana were these Dark Alin raiders and their genie leader defeated, bringing peace back to Padonia. Just west of Padonia is Parada, an enclave for a people of that same name. They command unique technology for building airships, and offer their services to the highest bidder. The region of Parada is a mountainous jungle, with various bridges connecting the rocky spires and plateaus reaching toward the heavens. The Parada Aerodrome acts as the region's capital, and is built upon the ruins of an ancient tower, which is seemingly only accessible from the air. The Paradan houses aided the Doge of Venucci in acquiring a powerful relic from a mine in the nearby state of Vernaza. Afterward, however, the Doge betrayed the Paradans laying siege to their great aerodrome by constructing a fortress of anti-air weapons called the Sky Crusher. The Mianans would come to Parada's aid, lifting the siege and destroying the Sky Crusher. As thanks, Parada provided air support to Miana in its war with Venucci. The mountains and jungles of Parada stretch west into a region called the Umberto Forest. Umberto is a contested region that is still recovering from the Condottieri War. New settlements have sprung up here, largely composed of citizens seeking escape from the conflicts in the north. A couple of these settlements initially swore loyalty to Pirata, though one of them ended up rebelling and tried to lay siege to the other loyal Piratan city. Mianan forces led by Giacomo destroyed the rebel pirates, freeing the loyalist city. There is another area of Umberto called the Lowlands. Abandoned by its previous inhabitants, this area now sees various mining companies moving into state claim over the Timonium deposits. It rains quite often in the lowlands, which can make mining operations difficult. North of Umberto is the Condottieri Castle. This castle once served as the capital of the former Vinci Empire. The geological region the castle is located in features the same mountainous jungle environments of Parata and Umberto. Condottieri Castle is the cornerstone of the infighting between the Condottieri factions. 
One faction will take control of the castle, only to be usurped by another in a constant cycle of warfare. During the Miana Venucci War, two condottieri factions, the Forzi and the Montucchi, fought over the castle. The Montucchi were the defenders, and the Forzi the aggressors. The leader of Miana, Giacomo, successfully aided one of the two factions in accomplishing their objective, though there are conflicting records regarding which of the two factions he chose to support. To the north of Cundatieri Castle is Monte Laguna. Named after the mountain that inhabits the region, Monte Laguna has grown fat from the rich Timonian deposits found here. In recent times, mining operations became automated using imported Mianan technology, further increasing profits. However, at some point, the automated machines turned against their Vinci owners and began attacking them. Only with the aid of Giacomo and other Vinci troops was this clockwork rebellion put down for good, though questions as to who turned the machines against their former masters were never answered. East of Monte Laguna is Vernaza. Vernaza is a Timonium-rich land, one that the city-state of Miana relied heavily upon. The Kundatieri received fees for mining rights in the state. However, the local inhabitants grew tired of seeing their land stripped bare, and the profits shipped off to the vaults of Kundatieri Castle. These mining companies were later driven out of the region by Miana troops, who needed the Timonium for their war effort against Venucci. Northeast of Vernaza is Torona. For the longest time, the Viscount of Tarona was a loyal and trusted servant of Miana, whose lord was Giacomo's father, and later his brother Petruzzo. However, when Petruzzo was killed by the Doge of Venucci, the Viscount withdrew Tarona from Miana control, becoming an independent state. Tarona would not maintain this independent status for long though, as the city of Miana, led by its new leader Giacomo, would remove the Viscount, bringing the state back under Miana control. West of Tarona is a region called the Wasteland. Under the control of one Lord Rocco, strip and bore mining had turned this once pristine land into a drab and dreary wasteland. Despite its desolate appearance, below the surface are vast Timonium reserves, which fuel the industrial and military might of Lord Rocco's forces. A small group led by an engineer named Distruzio rebelled against Lord Rocco. With the help of Miana, the Rebellion was able to overthrow Lord Rocco, removing a key ally of Venucci. Heading back west, near Cundatieri Castle, is the region of Corbonile. Corbonile is known for rugged terrain settled by stern folk, who take little interest in the affairs of others. The rough terrain makes passing through this land difficult, though that hasn't stopped various mining companies from digging up the rich Timonium deposits found beneath the land. South of Corbonile is the state of Moldini, which provides a key route of access to the rich state of Feligno to the west. Within the territory of Moldini was a great dried up reservoir, which oddly enough was called the Miana Reservoir. Perhaps the reservoir was once owned by Miana, but in the present time is overrun with Kundatieri mercenaries, who guard rich Timonium deposits and other sites. On the hill in the middle of the reservoir is a power plant, which supports a nearby village, which may have been a fishing village at a time when the reservoir was filled with water. Ruins of the previous empire are also scattered throughout the reservoir. Elsewhere in the region are the Maldini Heights. Rugged valleys scar this countryside, which has kept the Vinci mining companies reliant on air power to transport supplies and resources from plateau to plateau. Within the gorges of the heights are a plethora of ruins of the past Vinci Empire. Railways can be seen within these gorges, connecting the entrances of mines, where the companies extract timonium and perhaps even wealth in the form of relics from within the cliffside ruins. Another location of note in the state of Maldini is the Colosseum, or at least what's left of this wonder of the former empire. Now the region is inhabited by Condottieri, who mined the region for timonium, even if it means digging among the ruins of the Colosseum. As previously mentioned, to the west of Maldini is Feligno. At one time, this region was under the leadership of one Don Sclario, who was allied with the state of Venucci in the north. 
Unlike the Blasted Wasteland or Steam Choked Benucci, Feligno is a clean and prosperous place. The people of this region willingly gave their support to Don Sclario, who ruled with an iron fist. That was until he was removed from power by Giacomo and his allies. Though Feligno was now under Mianan control, they had to keep a watchful eye on events there, as the locals would not rest easy under the rule of those who removed a well-beloved leader. North of Feligno is Celia. Celia was once a peaceful countryside, until the Doge of Venucci took control of the region. Since then, Condottieri and mining companies have moved in and begun digging for Timonium, most of which seems to be located in the center of the Silean forest. North of Silea is Dirce, whose forest concealed a Condottieri fortress. However, the Condottieri no longer have control over the fortress, and rumors abound that the Doge now used it as a prison for enemies he wished to keep alive. This prison was also located next to a giant quarry, where the prisoners dug for Timonium and other resources sent north to Venucci. When the Mianan army came upon the prison during their advance north to Venucci, they sent in a strike force to free those held within it. The success of this breakout operation bolstered the Mianan army, as it continued north to Venucci through the state of Ranconi. Ranconi is surrounded by rugged terrain, and there is only one route across the Great Bridge to reach the city itself. This bridge is critical to trade in the city, and also makes for an ideal defensive position against any would-be aggressors. During the war, the bridge was heavily guarded by Venucci forces, but the Mianan army was able to force their way across the span regardless, and capture the capital city. Lastly, northwest of Ranconi is the state of Venucci, once under the regime of Doge Alessadri. The territory of Venucci had been transformed by the Doge's industry. At first, the people welcomed the changes brought by the Doge's industrial programs. However, they quickly became little more than slaves for his factories, which dedicated themselves to churning out machines of war. One of these war machines was a giant cannon called the Doge's Hammer. An initial prototype of this cannon was created and underwent trials in a region away from the capital city. This cannon was seemingly forgotten about after the fall of Venucci, and Condottieri mercenaries moved into the region to secure this prototype for themselves. A group of sentinels from the Quadal civilization, who were secretly working with the Doge at the time, are also camped out in this region, stranded after the Doge left with his forces for the Kalahisi Desert. In addition to the hammer, there was a giant mound in another, less polluted, area of the state, known as the Doge's Vault. The mound had four entrances which contained all the wealth the Doge had accumulated during his reign. After the Doge's downfall, the vault and surrounding lands were usurped by the Condottieri. In the present, these Condottieri fight for the loot contained within the vault, while also establishing mining outposts to extract the Timonium here. The capital city itself was conquered by a coalition of Mianan and Piratan forces led by Giacomo which brought an end to the Doge's reign over the inhabitants. The Venucci would have to rebuild on their own though, as the Mianan forces left the city in pursuit of the Doge and his remaining army. North of Venucci is a land known as the Northern Scars. Remnants of the previous Venci Empire can be found in this frigid land, though today it is disputed territory between Condottieri forces and native tribes of Berserkers. Venci cities are an amalgamation of rusting metal walls, wooden catwalks, spires of smokestacks, intertwining pipes, and an array of spinning gears. At the heart of every city is a towering furnace. Timonium fuels this furnace, which powers the entire city and any districts attached to it. As the city grows, so too does the furnace, for the bigger the city, the more power needed to support it. Four types of districts could be built around the furnace, the first being the military district. An expanding city would need to recruit more soldiers to protect it, and these soldiers would need to be housed and fed. The military district provides this, effectively increasing the population that can be supported. When a new military district is completed, a squad of musketeers is deployed outside it. 
In addition, the military district is capped off with a large mortar. This mortar can rotate 360 degrees and provides the city a strong defensive weapon against would-be attackers. Thanks to its large parabolic trajectory, the mortar can fire on targets in close proximity to the city, as well as hit targets behind obstacles or other fortifications. The more military districts a city has, the greater its population cap and defense. It should also be noted that a city's garrison of musketeers can engage enemy forces close by. The second kind of district was the Merchant District. The Merchant District is filled with markets where goods from across the Vinci states and beyond are bought and sold. A Merchant District increases a city's resource cap, enabling the populace to accumulate resources such as wealth and timonium at a greater rate. A Merchant District enables a city to support one additional trade caravan. Trade caravans are dirigible airships that fly between cities or other neutral sites to exchange goods. When a caravan begins its journey, the wealth income of the city increases and remains at a fixed rate so long as that caravan maintains its route between the two cities. The more merchant districts a city has, the higher its resource cap and the value of its trade routes through caravans. The industrial district is the third type of district that a city can construct and is unique to a Vinci city. Essentially a giant factory of moving pistons, this district increases the construction of any Vinci buildings, as well as the production speed of units. Each new industrial district added to a city enables the magistrate to research a unique technology at a nearby prototype factory. The fourth and final type of district was the palace district. When a city got large enough, it would need to construct a palace to better handle the city's day-to-day -day functions and other administrative affairs. There were two distinct design styles for a palace. The first design was a tall tower, which featured a spinning metal globe at the top. This design was only constructed at cities that were considered the capitals of their respective region. The second palace design had less grandeur compared to the first. Its highest point featured a clock tower, while a smaller globe was located lower down in front of the palace's main entrance. Regardless of the design, the palace districts performed the same functions. For one, they increased the size of the city, particularly the furnace at the center. A larger city meant greater trade value, defense, and expanded territorial borders. Upon completion of a palace, all current districts within the city were enhanced. Industrial districts had their construction and unit creation rates further increased. Merchant districts had greater resource caps, and military districts could sustain a greater population, in addition to immediately recruiting a squad of musketeers. The first palace district upgraded a standard city to a large city, while the creation of a second palace district upgraded the large city to a great city. However, a second palace district would only be available for construction after more of the other three district types had been built. The leader of a Vinci state could encourage a set of national policies, called technology tracks, for their people to focus on. The greater the research that was put into these policies, the greater their effects. The first of these was called politics. A focus in the politics track increased the national borders of that state, caused attrition to enemy forces within that state's territory, reduced the cost of buying out neutral sites, and reduced the damage taken by friendly infantry units when storming an enemy site or city. The troops would even storm the city faster. Instead of politics, the nation could focus on prosperity. Prosperity made sure that Vinci military forces had enough medical supplies and extra parts to repair their equipment. This enabled their troops to better recover from injuries while within their nation's borders, and provide repairs to mechanical units such as clockwork men, aircraft, and ground vehicles. A focus on prosperity makes the populace generally happier, passively increasing the nation's wealth income. A Vinci nation at war would benefit greatly from the scavenge trap. Such a policy enabled the collection of resources from friendly or enemy units that were killed in combat. Increasing focus in this policy reduced the rate of attrition that Vinci forces would endure while operating within enemy territory. Under this policy, the Vinci could steal 100% of the plunder when one of their buildings was destroyed. Further gains down this policy track include an increased supply radius from dirigible airships, 
and the ability for units to take no attrition damage within an enemy nation's borders, as long as they weren't moving or engaged in combat. Lastly, mining was a track that any Vinci could get behind, as it increased the amount of Timonium the nation could accumulate. It also enabled the use of a unique Vinci national power called Industrial Devastation. Industrial Devastation allows the Vinci to lay waste to large swaths of enemy land using underground drills. These drills wreak destruction on buildings and any ground units unlucky enough to be caught in their area of effect. The greater the focus on this technology track, the larger the area of devastation and destructive power wrought against those enemies caught within it. Speaking of mining, the Vinci's primary source of Timonium came from extracting the resource using mines. Mines come in various designs, though the most common one resembles an insect with pipes that look like legs, supporting a raised mouth that spews forth rock that is crushed into gravel. This gravel ends up in a bin on the ground next to a smokestack. Miners are recruited from the mines to extract Timonium nearby. While a mine is not required to be directly next to a Timonium deposit, it does increase the rate at which the miners gather the resource. Large cities have the capabilities to upgrade their mines to increase the output of each miner nearby and improve the durability of the mine itself to better resist attacks from enemy forces. Research into mechanization at the prototype factory would enable mines to build clockwork miners who are more efficient at gathering resources compared to human ones. The best way for the Vinci to defend their territory, as well as acquire more of it, was to construct a barracks to train infantry units. The building features a glass tower with speakers on top that acts as a command post, overseeing the grounds where the troops conduct their training. A couple of dummy targets are placed within these grounds. Fans help keep the interior of the barracks cool for those living inside. The barracks is where Vinci Musketeers are recruited, trained, and equipped. It's also where clockwork men and spiders are assembled. The clockwork units can receive further upgrades here, alongside extended training that can be invested into the Musketeers to improve their combat capabilities. The Aerodrome is a tall structure where most Vinci aircraft are created. These aircraft are deployed from the landing pad atop the tower and include the Scout Flyer, Pirata Flyer, Cargo Dirigible, and Air Destroyer. Any upgrades available for these aircraft can be requisitioned from the Aerodrome. More information regarding these upgrades are covered later in the Units chapter. In order to build advanced ground vehicles, the Vinci would first construct a Steam Fortress. A Steam Fortress was basically an all-in-one manufacturing plant and fortress. When complete, the Steam Fortress expands the national borders of the Vinci Nation. The manufacturing aspect of this building enabled the construction of steam-powered units, including the Steam Cannon, Juggernaut, and Land Leviathan. This includes any upgrades that can be purchased for these units. The fortress aspect of this building becomes quite clear to attackers, both on the ground and in the air, who would find themselves under fire by a barrage of rockets launched from the building. These rockets were backed up by the musket fire of the fortress's troop garrison. To protect their borders or other sites of interest, the Vinci could build guard towers, also called defense towers. While not as strong as a steam fortress, the cannon atop the tower could defend against both ground and air units. While the tower could rotate 360 degrees, it did have a small radius of indefensible dead zone, where the cannon would be unable to engage enemy units at the base of the tower. Part of recruiting the Zeke bot from the prototype factory include improvements in armor to defense towers and steam fortresses. Research could be conducted at the prototype factory that would improve military buildings. Once this research was complete, all buildings would gain automated repair systems to fix any damage they sustained in combat. Part of this upgrade included additional improvements to the steam fortress and guard towers. For the former, they would become super steam fortresses, having increased armor and attack power. Guard towers would become improved towers, which were cheaper, stronger, and faster to build. Research labs were small structures of spinning gears that act as a base for one of several larger buildings to be constructed from. The basic lab provides a Vinci leader with a couple of research points that can be invested into the already discussed technology tracks. 
However, it was best for the leader to upgrade the lab to a building with a more defined role that would benefit the Vinci Nation, and provide additional research points. The borehole was one building the research lab could be upgraded to. This giant drill digs deep into the earth right above a subterranean timonium deposit. The gathered timonium is stored in cylindrical containers at the edge of the hole. Instead of timonium, the borehole can generate wealth which is done by selling off the dug-up timonium. The drill of the borehole can be improved to gather even more timonium or collect more wealth. A giant telescope could be built from the lab which would be used to find sites far away through the fog of war. The telescope can be directed to actively reveal a portion of shrouded land. If ordered to view a different stretch of land, the previous portion would be re-shrouded. The telescope was a good way to keep watch on rival factions in a region, without having to risk sending out scouting units. Instead of a telescope, the research lab could be upgraded to become a giant calculator. The calculator enables the trading of timonium in exchange for wealth, and vice versa. At the same time, the calculator reduces the construction cost of any buildings constructed next to it. For example, a barracks that would normally cost 115 timonium elsewhere would instead only cost 103 timonium when built next to the calculator. The machine could even be upgraded to offer better exchange rates. The timonium smelter was another structure built up from the research lab. The building features a crane that picks up spare parts from a pile and drops them into a bucket. These parts, along with timonium extracted from mines, are smelted down into the pure timonium base metal, which is used to produce a steady stream of clockwork men. Any damaged vehicles or other mechanical units in the vicinity of the smelter would also receive repairs from the building. If the Vinci really needed to defend their territory, they could upgrade a lab to become a bunker fort. This is an incredibly strong structure that can absorb a lot of damage, whether it be from Vinci gunpowder weapons, the magics used by the Alin, or the beam weapons of the Quaddle. A large number of Vinci units can take shelter inside the bunker, which, like the Steam Fortress, is armed with rockets that can be launched against ground and air units. The bunker can be garrisoned by infantry and ground vehicles, including the large Juggernaut tanks. There is a limit to the number of units the bunker can shelter, though, and the larger the unit, the more space it takes up. The bunker even has manufacturing facilities beneath it, which can create and deploy the same vehicles from the Steam Fortress. Another defensive structure that could be built up from the research lab was the Nullifier. This tower, when activated, negates all spells, abilities, and powers across an entire region for a few seconds. One knows when the tower is activated due to violet-colored particles permeating the air, while rays of ultraviolet light shine through the sky. Only when these effects dissipate can spells and powers be used once again. Perhaps the most grand of all the lab upgrades was the glorious statue. The statue depicts Doge Alessadri of Venucci holding a spinning globe in his right hand, raised toward the sky, while mechanical soldiers patrol the base of the statue on a rotating gear. This statue inspires any ground units within its vicinity, increasing their attack power. The affected units become so inspired that they are said to physically glow. The Glorious Statue is also a recruitment and manufacturing structure, where the Doge's elite guard and walker units are created. The last, and ostensibly, the most powerful building to be constructed from the research lab is the Doom Cannon. As its name implies, the Doom Cannon was a giant cannon that could deliver devastating attacks against cities, buildings, and ground units. The cannon could rotate 360 degrees, but at a slow rate. The cannon could fire one of three types of shells across a great distance. The shrapnel shell had a wide blast radius designed to take out masses of enemy ground units. The gas shell had a moderate blast radius and was designed to cover an area with poisonous gas that kills anyone who lingers in the cloud for too long. This makes the shell particularly effective at preventing enemies from mining at a timonium deposit. The third ammo type was the Demolition Shell. It had the smallest blast radius, but was effective at destroying a single structure or shattering a city's defenses, making it vulnerable for troops to storm. 
After firing, a new shell is rolled out of a canister located at the back left side of the cannon, and is carefully loaded into the weapon using a cart and set of gears. It would take some time for the crew at the Doom Cannon to assemble another copy of the shell type that had just been fired. Next to almost every major city in Avengers State was a building called the Prototype Factory. Here, scientists and engineers experiment on already existing technologies, seeking ways to improve them, as well as create prototypes of new inventions. A Vinci Magistrate could visit the Prototype Factory to acquire one of three special technologies. These could be in the form of upgrades to already existing units and buildings, a prototype of a new invention, or a set of plans to improve productivity and efficiency of the city-state. Any technologies or improvements related to specific Vinci units will be covered in that chapter of the video, so for now, I'll just go over the other available options. For technologies or policies that affect all Vinci ground units, the facility could research superior training. Once complete, it would increase the ground unit's attack and trample. Monoculars were a technology that, when researched, would affect all Vinci units, providing them with increased attack range, line of sight, and speed. The engineers at the Prototype Factory could focus their studies on infiltration tactics. If adopted, Vinci's soldiers would learn how to capture cities faster, and the number of troops required to storm cities or other neutral sites would be reduced. In addition, the cost to purchase sites or cities using wealth was reduced, thanks to improved methods of negotiation. The personnel of the Prototype Factory could study the history and achievements of Giacomo, inventor of Miana. The lessons learned from studying this notable Vinci hero were then compiled into a single work called Giacomo's Gift. When acquired, it reduced research time for advances, prototypes, and unit upgrades by 100%. It even cut the research time for powers of other Vinci heroes by half. The prototype factory could produce med packs, which, when acquired, would be distributed among Vinci military forces, increasing the health of these units and their attack damage. Two of the three final prototypes one could acquire from the prototype factory were a princely gift and increased production. These would also be the most expensive to acquire but they could be reacquired repeatedly at an ever-increasing cost. A princely gift would provide 600 wealth to the Vinci Magistrate, whereas increased production, well, increased the speed at which units were produced, while also reducing their cost. Other Vinci buildings included the Scrapyard, which functioned very similarly to a Timonium smelter. Using scrap metal and other discarded parts, the Scrapyard would create clockwork units who would do the bidding of their masters. Power plants could be seen across the Vinci lands, which provided electricity to nearby farms, villages, or other sites, assuming the owners of the plant didn't just keep the power for themselves. These sites were typically guarded by clockwork men, and when captured, would speed up unit production. Condottieri, or other groups of renegade Vinci, would hoard any wealth they collected inside an engraver, which could be best described as a clockwork chest. Capturing such a site would provide additional wealth income for the new owner. The engraver could even be upgraded to a mint, further increasing the wealth it generated. Similar to the engraver, there was the Alchemy Workshop, which was a cylindrical container where Timonium was collected and stored. Capturing the site provided additional Timonium income for the new owner. The site could be upgraded to become an Alchemy Lab, further increasing the Timonium it generated. Those traveling across Vinci lands, particularly on foot, could rest at a roadside inn. Inns were great places to hire renegade soldiers, who would serve their employer for a short time. An inn could be upgraded to become a meeting house, which increases the size of hired mercenary armies, as well as the population cap of the city-state that owns the meeting house. The Vinci's steam technology elevated their civilization to a new level of prosperity, but it also brought about new ways for them to wage war, mostly against each other. With the city-state's constant infighting, much of their production is put towards ever-increasing methods of destruction. This could take many forms, from infantrymen armed with muskets, to clockwork machinations, flying dirigibles, and steam-powered cannons. 
While not military units, miners were vital for extracting timonium from deposits using pickaxes. Depending on the size of the timonium deposit depended on the number of miners that could actively mine from it. Miners were vulnerable to attacks from enemy forces, and other than their pickaxes, were unable to defend themselves. The exception to this would be if a Vinci leader researched armed civilians from the prototype facility. This enabled miners to be trained faster, increase their health, and armed them with pistols to better defend themselves against attackers. Instead of arming their human miners, the local Vinci leader could conduct Tier 1 research into clockwork mining. The results of which would be a single clockwork miner, who could gather more timonium than a human one. In addition, any future clockwork miners purchased from the prototype facility would receive a bonus increase to their mining rate. While clockwork miners could be considered more dispensable compared to their human counterparts, they were more than capable of holding their ground against enemy forces. More clockwork miners and upgrades could be purchased at additional tiers of the prototype factory. Two clockwork miners could be acquired as a tier 2 prototype. Three could be acquired at tier 3, and four at tier 4. At tier 5, a clockwork foreman could be built. On its own, the foreman could mine the largest amount of timonium. The foreman even enhanced the mining capabilities of both human and clockwork miners in its vicinity. Eventually, research at Tier 7, called mechanization, would enable mines to produce clockwork miners themselves, no longer having to rely on the prototype factory to build them. With mechanization, mines would no longer train human miners. Imperial Musketeers were the primary infantry unit of all the major Vinci city-states. A single squad has a total of nine Musketeers. Besides their primary weapon, the Imperial Musketeers were clad from head to toe in armor. This armor was passed down from the days of the former Empire, being improved with the latest technologies, such as a clockwork motor on the right or left arm, spring-loaded pulleys, flexible spring-knee plates, and a modified eyepiece on their helmet which acted as a miniature scope for seeing things at a distance. Additionally, the helmet was painted with the unit's insignia. A musketeer carried additional supplies on his back, including a slashed pack cover to hold extra pouches and a bedroll. Some musketeers were given a pistol, carried in a holster strapped to their side. Imperial musketeers performed all manner of duties for their respective city-state, from defending its territory to conquering an opponent's. Musketeers fought at range, and though they could engage in melee combat, it was not their preferred method of engagement. Their primary role when directly assaulting an enemy city or neutral site was to storm the dwelling after it had been sufficiently weakened. Storming involved the musketeers entering the city or site directly in order to capture it. This could not be done without the musketeers taking some casualties, however, so sometimes it was better to just bombard the site into submission. Imperial Musketeers could receive further training from the barracks, becoming better soldiers. By default, Musketeers arrange themselves at a fire-at-will stance, where they engage an enemy upon sight, with each Musketeer firing as fast as he could reload his weapon. The squad sergeant could order the Musketeers into a volley fire stance. In this stance, the Musketeers fire their weapons at the same time, which does more damage to the enemy, but at the cost of the Musketeers being unable to move as well as being more vulnerable to incoming fire. With extra training, squads of Imperial Musketeers would become Imperial Grenadiers. By default, Grenadiers would orient themselves in a skirmish stance, which was a loose order formation which increased their range defense, movement speed, and line of sight. Further training upgraded Grenadiers to Fusiliers. Fusiliers learned to align themselves into an assault stance. In this stance, the squad loses its ranged attack, but they have a much stronger melee attack and greater resistance to being trampled over by larger units. Musketeers could receive a few upgrades from the prototype factory, the most important of which were infiltration tactics, which enabled the troops to capture cities faster while also reducing the number required to storm a city or site. Besides the Imperial Musketeers of a city-state, there are many renegade musketeers that control neutral sites, such as inns or small independent cities. While not as well equipped as imperial musketeers, the renegades could still put up a fight, which is why it was sometimes easier for the leader of a local city to buy them out. 
Renegade Musketeers could be hired from an inn for a limited time. The Doge of Benucci created his own company of musketeers called the Elite Guard. Elite Guard wore distinct gas masks, helping them stand out from the Imperial Musketeer units. Elite Guard could only be trained from a glorious statue, but they were more experienced than the average musketeer. For one, the Elite Guard knew how to position themselves in all available tactical stances without needing any additional training. The Elite Guard were immune to the long-term effects of enemy powers and abilities, especially any toxic weapons deployed by the Doge himself. The barracks wasn't just the place to train new human recruits. It was also where the Vinci's clockwork units were assembled, the most recognizable of which was the Clockwork Man. Unlike the Musketeers, who preferred to engage enemies at range, the Clockwork Man would actively stomp towards enemy units and fight them in melee combat. The Clockwork Man would knock units around with its arms, sending them flying a short distance. The Clockwork Man did have a short-ranged electrical weapon on its right arm to shock enemies in buildings. This weapon was detachable and could be replaced with a different one, such as a long-range rifle. A unit armed with such a weapon was called a Clockwork Sniper, and was exclusively assembled at the Prototype Factory. The Sniper was particularly good at taking shots against hero units. It was best for Clockwork men to fight in groups, as they would gain a couple of notable benefits. The first was the Clockwork men fighting side by side would have increased attack power. The second was that if one Clockwork man was destroyed, the survivors could use its parts to repair themselves. Clockwork men could be upgraded from the barracks, increasing their combat effectiveness. The first upgrade turned the standard Clockwork man into a heavy Clockwork man and the second upgrade took it from a heavy to a super clockwork man. The only visual difference between the standard and upgraded clockwork man was that the upgraded ones emitted a yellow glow on their right arm. Even without a barracks, a clockwork man could be assembled by anyone with the know-how. Because of this, there were many variations of the unit, such as the aforementioned clockwork sniper and the scavenger grunt, which was put together by Renegade Vinci or the Kundatieri. Notable Vinci hero Giacomo developed his own variation called Demolition Clockwork Men. These were strapped with explosives, which they would carry towards enemies, ideally arriving next to them just in time for the explosives to detonate. The last clockwork unit that could be assembled at the barracks was the Clockwork Spider. The Spider was more powerful, but also more expensive than the Clockwork Man. Unlike the Clockwork Man, the Spider was capable of trampling enemies beneath its eight legs when engaging them in melee. Trampling knocks down infantry units, stunning them and making them vulnerable to attack. More importantly, the Spider had a rocket launcher atop its body. This rocket is used by the Spider against buildings, and especially aircraft, enabling the Spider to act as an anti-air ground unit. Even better was that the Spiders could fire this rocket while on the move. In addition, the Clockwork Spider had a web weapon that would freeze enemy units, and halt the actions of an enemy building. Units that are trapped within the web take damage from it. This damage is increased if the Spider was upgraded to a heavy Clockwork Spider from the barracks. Like with his elite guard, the Doge of Benucci had his own mechanical walker unit called the Doge Walker. Produced at the Glorious Statue, the Doge Walker is the opposite of the Clockwork Man, preferring to engage targets at a distance using the two cannons on its arms. Unlike the Clockwork Man, the Dogewalker did seem to have a pilot who operated the vehicle from inside its cylindrical body. Though they weren't melee units, the Dogewalker could trample enemy infantry and even aim its gun skyward to fire upon air units. Infantry units wouldn't typically work alone, especially during a full-scale conflict where they would be supported by, and supporting, ground vehicles produced from the Steam Fortress. For sieging cities and providing long-range artillery support, there was the Steam Cannon. This heavy ground unit was slow and quite vulnerable, being lightly armored due to the large cannon it carried. This cannon could do substantial damage against buildings and cause splash damage that would affect clustered enemy units. Even more impressive was the Steam Cannon's ability to hit flying targets, whether they be mechanical or beast. As with most units, the Steam Cannon could be upgraded, becoming a Super Steam Cannon, 
denoted by a yellow glowing light on the cannon itself. The Venucci military created their own version of the steam cannon, called the Doge Cannon. Its role was exactly the same as the original version, the only difference being its design. The Doge Cannon was only encountered in the field during the siege of Venucci by Mianid forces, which occurred during the Great War between the two city-states. Enemy forces could easily deal with the steam cannon if they got close enough to it, exploiting its weak armor and inability to crush units even half its size. One vehicle that could not be easily dealt with, however, was the Juggernaut. While considered a, quote, medium tank, the Juggernaut was large and heavily armored. The vehicle's primary armament were two impressive cannons affixed to a rotating turret set atop the chassis. These cannons were effective against basically anything, from buildings and other vehicles, to creatures large and small. They could even engage low-flying air units. In addition to its primary cannons, the Juggernaut has a couple smaller gun turrets attached to each side of the vehicle's chassis, used to deal with infantry attempting to disable the tank's tracks. Even without these side turrets, this could be a difficult task, as the Juggernaut could easily crush infantry units beneath its massive treads. As if the Juggernaut wasn't already powerful enough, it could be upgraded to become an Ultra Juggernaut from the Steam Fortress, denoted by the yellow glow emanating from its main guns. The prototype factory could provide a Vinci leader with one free Ultra Juggernaut at its final tier. Despite its size and armament, the Juggernaut was not the most powerful of the Vinci ground vehicles. That honor goes to the Leviathan, a giant, six-legged, steam-powered mechanical walker that best resembles a crab. Initially built for mining operations, the Leviathan made an excellent, albeit expensive, machine of war. Its entire body is surrounded by crushers, which of course, could grind up any infantry units that happen to be too close to the Leviathan, somehow managing to avoid getting squashed by one of its six legs. The claws of the Leviathan are two large drills, used to either dig into the earth to find timonium deposits, or destroy enemy units and buildings. Even better was that one of these claws acted as a missile that, when fired, caused massive damage to the target. This missile was capable of completely shattering the defenses of even the largest city. Instead of destruction, the Leviathan could use its drills to burrow beneath the earth. The walker moves underground to emerge elsewhere in the region. The walker could do this to travel great distances in a short time span, or escape a battle it cannot win. A heavily damaged Leviathan had the capability to conduct a repair cycle. When activated, the machine goes dormant for a short time, during which it takes less damage and repairs itself. Once repairs are complete, the Leviathan can once again move and fight. The Leviathan was armed with several ranged weapons, including a few gun turrets located atop the back of the walker. These turrets could be used against both ground and air units. Attached to the back of the Leviathan's body was a missile launcher that could launch a volley of eight missiles at a single target. Like all other Vinci ground units, the Leviathan could be upgraded at the Steam Fortress, becoming a King Leviathan, further enhancing its destructive might and solidifying its place as the most powerful unit in the Vinci arsenal. The Vinci's technology allowed them to take to the skies, developing aircraft that they used for trade, transportation, and warfare. Vinci cities would often trade with each other and neutral sites using trade caravans. Trade caravans were dirigible airships that carried supplies on their backs, located between the two balloons that enabled the craft to fly. Trade caravans are responsible for generating wealth for a Vinci city, making them a vital asset that needed to be protected. Included in the armed civilians research from the prototype factory, caravans would be created faster, have increased durability, and were armed with a gun turret that would enable the caravan to defend itself against hostile units. Generally speaking, the more merchant districts a city had, the more caravans that it could support. Over time, caravans can reduce the wealth costs needed to purchase a neutral site. This cost would eventually reach zero, automatically bringing the site under the control of a nearby Vinci city. It should be noted that the Vinci did have ground vehicles that they used to trade between each other and beyond in the desert lands of the Alin. 
However, trade by air was more efficient, especially through the jungle mountain regions where many Vinci lived. Caravans were basic supply transports, unlike the cargo dirigible, a large supply transport that was constructed at an aerodrome. They feature two wings with prop engines that made up part of the frame that surrounded the balloon located in the middle. There were two cockpits where the pilots were located, attached to two fuselages on each side of the balloon. Cargo dirigibles were designed to support a Vinci army, especially one that was operating within enemy territory. So long as the army remained in the vicinity of a cargo dirigible, it would take no attrition damage. Additionally, the cargo dirigible could transport Vinci ground units, usually across a cliff or over inhospitable ground. The dirigible was completely unarmed though, making it an easy target for enemy forces. The cargo dirigible could be upgraded to become an improved, and later, a heavy cargo dirigible. With each upgrade, the durability of the dirigible increased, along with the number of units it could carry. When it received the heavy upgrade, it was capable of carrying at least two siege units, whereas before it couldn't carry any siege units. For scouting out newly discovered territory, the Vinci would use the Scout Flyer. The Scout Flyer was a small, fast-moving, steam-powered helicopter that featured an aerial screw which gave the Scout its flight capabilities. While exploring a region, the Scout Flyer could pick up relics found on the ground, which always contain a small amount of timonium. Scout flyers can be upgraded from the aerodrome, upgrades that arm the flyer with a few combat capabilities. The first were a couple of parachute drones. One of these was a gun drone, which attacked ground units as it floated downward. The other was called an air mine drone, which performed the same function as the gun drone, except that it only targeted air units. The last armament was a parachute bomb. This bomb used a fuse which was lit during deployment. The bomb would slowly float down to the ground, where it would explode, causing widespread damage that knocked down enemy units. The bomb could be destroyed before it hit the ground, though the explosion would still damage enemy units, but with reduced effect. A new prototype of the Scout Flyer could be acquired from the prototype factory, called the Spy Scout Flyer. The Spy Scout performed the same functions as the standard Scout, but was equipped with mirrors that would rotate around the aircraft. These mirrors enabled the Spy Scout to activate a cloaking field, which camouflaged the flyer for a short time, making it invisible to the naked eye. In addition, acquiring the Spy Scout provides strengthened airframes for standard Scout flyers, and increases their movement speed. The Vinci of Pirata were renowned for producing aircraft, the first of which was the Pirata Flyer. The Parada Flyer made use of two aerial screws in order to obtain and maintain flight. The engine was located at the tail of the flyer. Strapped to the underbelly of the aircraft were supply bags, and at the front of the flyer, below the nose, was its primary weapon. The Parada Flyer's gun turret could rotate 360 degrees and fire upon both air and ground targets. Though it could engage ground targets, the Parada Flyer was best used as a fighter against enemy air units. As with other Vinci units, the Parada Flyer could receive upgrades from the aerodrome, denoted by the yellow glow emitted from the aircraft's engine and turret. A more advanced prototype of the Parada Flyer could be obtained from the prototype factory, called the Gun Flyer. The Gun Flyer featured a single large aerial screw for flight, and while it had two light cannons as its primary weapons, they were not attached to a rotating turret, instead being mounted on each side of the flyer, near the cockpit. The gun flyer was also armed with rocket pods mounted on wings that were attached to each side of the aircraft, making it effective against stronger units and creatures. Acquiring the gun flyer prototype also increased the anti-air attack and speed of Parada flyers. Another Piratan-made aircraft was the Air Destroyer. Larger than the Parada flyer, the Air Destroyer was a vertical takeoff and landing craft that specialized in destroying ground units and buildings. The destroyer achieved this using rockets held in pods attached beneath each of the aircraft's long wings. Atop the destroyer, amid the fuselage, was a ball turret, which was used to defend the aircraft against flying enemy units, as its rockets were only effective against ground forces. Normally, the air destroyer launches one rocket after another in quick succession in a single salvo. 
However, the destroyers could also launch an entire barrage of rockets at once, doing great amounts of damage to a single target. A prototype of the air destroyer, called the transport destroyer, could be developed at the prototype factory. The transport destroyer could be best described as an armed cargo dirigible, capable of airlifting several small units, or a couple of large ones, while also being able to defend itself. Unlike the cargo dirigible though, the transport destroyer could not provide nearby units with supplies to negate attrition while in enemy territory. In addition, acquiring the transport destroyer increased the ground attack and armor of any already deployed or future air destroyers. The last Vinci air unit could only be developed exclusively at a prototype factory. This unit was the Siege Zeppelin. The Siege Zeppelin was a giant blimp that carried a cylindrical armored shell hanging below it using ropes. This shell housed the crew of the Zeppelin and was armed with eight field cannons. Some of the crew would operate the burner in the middle of the shell, while others steered the Zeppelin. The rest would man the cannons, raining artillery fire down upon enemy units below them. These cannons had long range, being highly effective at destroying buildings and bombarding cities. The Zeppelin had no anti-air capabilities, so needed to be supported by units such as the Parada Flyer. The knowledge and materials used to develop the Siege Zeppelin could be applied to steam cannons in the Vinci's arsenal, thus increasing their own siege attack. The Condottieri had their own military units that, while not as technologically advanced, could put up a fight, especially when defending the various sites and cities they controlled. Most Kundatieri forces were stationed at an outpost, where units would be housed inside tents. If these outposts were captured, a Vinci leader could hire Kundatieri mercenaries to fight for him. There were two kinds of Kundatieri melee units, referred to as soldiers and knights. The soldiers oriented themselves in a nine-man squad similar to the musketeers, but they were armed with a sword and shield, always looking to engage in close quarters combat with their foes. The knights were typically arranged in a three-man team and fought from atop their armored steeds using sabers. Knights were able to operate within enemy territory without suffering from attrition. For ranged units, the Condottieri used dragoons. Dragoons were cavalrymen armed with a pair of pistols. The dragoons were well-trained, able to fire and reload their weapons quickly, faster than a standard musketeer squad could reload their rifles. Though they were poor melee fighters, Dragoons excelled at hit-and-run tactics. Among the Vinci civilization, several notable individuals would make a name for themselves, whether it be through their unique inventions, strong leadership, or prowess in battle. Each hero had a set of abilities and other skills that they made use of during conflicts. As they gained more experience, their abilities improved, becoming more powerful. Perhaps the most famous of these individuals was Giacomo Jamba, inventor of Miana. Giacomo was the youngest of two sons, whose father was the Lord of Miana. The city of Miana had a long history of producing geniuses, and Giacomo was one of its proudest sons. He learned everything there was to know at the Mianan academies, being years ahead of his own teachers so much so that he garnered a reputation as the young inventor of Miana. Though he was a brilliant mind, Giacomo was set to be conscripted into the military like his brother Petruzzo before him. Giacomo had no interest in learning the art of warfare, instead wanting to go out and explore the world. On the eve of his conscription, Giacomo chose to run away from home, heading through the Cilia Pass to reach the Kalahisi Desert, where he hoped to see the Alin Kingdom. Giacomo was woefully unprepared for the harsh, vast desert, however, and nearly died if he hadn't been rescued by a caravan of Alin traders. Giacomo lived among the Alin at the great city of Azur Harif for at least four months until he was found by a Mianan expedition that brought him home. After the passing of his father some time later, Giacomo's older brother Petruzzo would become Lord of Miana. Petruzzo was the opposite of Giacomo, being born a soldier and content to take up the mantle of leadership though Petruzzo also understood that Giacomo's calling was that of an inventor and engineer, so allowed his younger brother to focus on such interests unhindered. However, Petruzzo's death at the hands of the Doge of Venucci forced Giacomo to become Lord of Miana, 
successfully leading the state in their war of vengeance against the Doge. Giacomo had a particular interest in the clockwork mechanisms and machines utilized throughout Vinci society. Wherever he was located, Giacomo would enhance the capabilities of all friendly clockwork units nearby. He even provided free research initiatives to a Vinci city upon first arrival, and whenever he gained a new level of experience. Giacomo used a custom-built clockwork mech walker which he often piloted when commanding his forces on the field of battle. This walker, which took inspiration from the Great Inventor's own, was armed with a cannon attached to its left arm that would fire shells directly at enemy units on the ground and in the air. This weapon was highly effective against infantry, with the force of the explosion knocking down enemy soldiers within the small blast radius. Giacomo could use his walker to trample infantry, knocking them over and stunning them. Against other units in close combat, such as clockwork men, Giacomo's walker could stomp on them to cause damage. Giacomo had a few other gadgets and abilities up his sleeve that he could deploy during battle using his walker. The first of these was called Inspired Augmentation. This was an area of effectability that, when deployed, would inspire nearby friendly units, increasing their speed and attack power. This ability also heals injured soldiers and repairs mechanical units. The cannon on Giacomo's walker could be attuned to fire a sonic burst. This is a destructive wave of sound that, while not causing much damage, would knock back smaller units such as infantry and stun larger ones for a few seconds. Giacomo had a strong familiarity with clockwork men, so much so that he created his own models armed with explosives. He could summon a demolition team of these units, which would walk toward a target and explode, causing a substantial amount of damage to said target and any surrounding entities caught in the blast radius. Initially, there were three bomb-laden clockwork men in a team, but this team could be enhanced to include a total of four, and later five clockwork men. Giacomo's final ability was called Super Armor. Like Augmented Inspiration, this ability affects all friendly units in a wide area, but instead of healing or boosting their combat capabilities, Super Armor provides them with a shield that makes the units invulnerable from all enemy damage for 60, and if upgraded, 120 seconds. Giacomo would use this walker model until he made it to the Kumi jungle, where he constructed a new one based on Quaddle technology, which had an entirely different suite of functions and abilities. When Giacomo became Lord of Miana, he relied greatly on his military advisor, General Carlini, when conducting their war against the Doge. Carlini was an old veteran, who served as military advisor to Giacomo's father and his brother Petruzzo. Carlini had been a soldier for 43 years, had killed more men than he could count, and had his right leg blown off, which was replaced with a mechanical one. Despite his age and handicap, Carlini never backed down from a fight. He was often seen fighting alongside Miana troops, and served as Giacomo's military advisor until his demise at the hands of a Quattle god in the Kumi jungle. Due to the loss of his leg, Carlini preferred to fight from the saddle of his horse, who was a tough animal in its own right able to trample soldiers beneath its hooves. Carlini's presence on the battlefield increased the morale of Imperial Musketeers, boosting their combat effectiveness. Using a musket modified as a sniper rifle, Carlini could pick off targets at a distance. Indeed, Carlini was so skilled with the rifle that he could snipe a single target, instantly killing it. While some targets like mechanical units may not be destroyed by this snipe, they would still take a significant amount of damage, being struck at one of their weak points. Carlini later applied an improved scope to his rifle, increasing the range of his attacks, line of sight, and speed. Carlini wasn't opposed to carrying other more technological gadgets with him, one of which was a turret. When deployed, this automated turret shoots rapidly at any nearby enemies. The turret was temporary, and would explode at the end of its lifespan. However, it could be upgraded, which increased its size, durability, and operational capabilities. Carlini could hype himself up with a charge from his great steed, making him nearly invulnerable and supremely powerful for a short time, allowing him to hold his ground when outnumbered. The city state of Pirata was a haven for various renowned sky captains and their crew. Among the leaders of the Pirata houses, Lenora was chief. Her skill as a pilot was legendary, but even those tales were exceeded by her reputation as a ruthless competitor in business and sport. 
Recognizable thanks to her auburn hair, Lenore's fearless nature and skill allow her to perform acts of daring combat and ruthless piracy. Her presence in the skies above the battlefield increased the range and line of sight of friendly aerodrome units, as well as providing extra wealth income. Lenore took flight on her own heavily modified version of a Pirata Flyer, which was equipped with a greater armament, engines, and armor compared to the standard flyer. The primary weapon on the aircraft was a Gatling gun, effective at taking out enemy aircraft and air units. The firepower of the aircraft could be enhanced using boosters. When activated, Lenora's craft reveals even more weapons, including light cannons and rockets. The endurance of the aircraft is also boosted, along with the engines, enabling it to fly faster. The boosted firepower of Lenora's aircraft was quite effective when focusing against a single strong target, such as an enemy hero. Being a pirate, Lenora was an expert in acts of piracy. She did this utilizing hooks equipped onto her aircraft. When these hooks grabbed hold of an enemy unit, that unit would be permanently brought under Lenora's control. The more experience Lenora gained in piracy, the stronger the units that she could bring under her control. For example, small units, like infantry, would only need one shot of hooks, while medium units would require two hook shots. With each upgrade, the number of units Lenora could control at the same time also increased. Lenora kept a flare with her to call in a couple of powerful strikes to devastate enemy forces. Against air units, Lenora could signal for a skyburst, an explosion that does massive damage to air units. This includes Vinci or Quaddle aircraft, as well as Aline creatures. Against ground units, Lenora would signal for a cluster bomb. This strike scatters powerful bombs across a wide area, devastating to infantry and causing substantial damage to larger units. Lenore would play a vital role in supporting Giacomo and his quest for vengeance against the Doge, even going as far as to accompany him on other adventures across the continent. Another well-known piratan was Commander Venza. Venza was a mercenary, though tales of her heroism made her popular with the common people. On the other hand, local magistrates knew her as a ruthless traitor willing to break the rules. Due to her reputation, Venza would reduce the cost of acquiring neutral sites when present in a region. Like Lenora, Venza could also increase wealth income for whoever hired her. Venza had her own custom-built aircraft that she flew everywhere. The aircraft was armed with four rapid-firing machine guns that were highly effective against enemy infantry or light aircraft. Venza could enhance her flyer using various upgrades that increased its endurance and speed. Benza could be summoned to the battlefield faster for a cheaper cost with these upgrades, too. Being a pirate, Benza was skilled in looting her targets. When focused on plundering, Benza would generate one wealth for each point of damage done to her enemies. Just like upgraded scout flyers, Benza carried a few gun drones with her. When deployed, these gun drones provided line of sight, while randomly firing at enemies as they floated to the ground from their parachutes. Unlike the scout flyers, which could only deploy one type of drone at a time, Venza deployed five of these drones at once. As she gained experience, Venza could create more of these drones, enabling her to deploy more of them at the same time. Lastly, Venza could signal for a siege zeppelin to temporarily support her in battle. Though Lord Rocco was the official leader of the Wasteland, some locals resisted his rule, forming a rebellion led by a red-haired man named Destruzio. Destruzio had an intuitive talent with machines, but his instability made him perilous to be near. In the field, Destruzio was often seen piloting his personalized tank, which was armed with several guns to fire upon his enemies at range. Destruzio always carried a couple types of grenades with him. The first of these was an explosive grenade. This kind of grenade damaged any units caught within its blast radius. The second grenade type was a healing grenade. This is the exact opposite of the explosive grenade, healing any friendly units in its vicinity. The problem was that Destruzio could be a bit of a clumsy fellow, which meant there was always a slim chance that he might grab the wrong grenade. So, instead of healing allies with a healing grenade, he would accidentally end up hurting them with an explosive grenade. Similar to Giacomo, Destruzio could summon clockwork units to aid him. However, the type of clockwork units were random, so they could be either clockwork miners, men, or spiders. 
Lastly, for Destruzio, he could randomly improve one of his own statistics, choosing between ground attack, air attack, building attack, or health. Destruzio did not work alone. Often accompanying him was his robot companion, Zeke. Zeke was created by Destruzio, and had a unique set of capabilities depending on what form the bot was functioning in. In battle form, Zeke maintained a balance of survivability and combat effectiveness. Zeke was armed with a wrench which he used for engineering purposes, but also battle, using the tool to whack down enemy units. Against range units or buildings, Zeke would holster his wrench and use rapid-firing guns located inside his hands. In recon form, Zeke took to the sky, deploying a propeller that allowed him to fly across the land. In this form, Zeke could quickly explore a region, uncovering the fog of war, locating neutral sites, and discovering the locations of enemy forces. However, he was completely unarmed, and exchanged armor for speed, making him highly vulnerable to damage should he be attacked. Zeke's final mode was Siege Form. In Siege Form, Zeke's right arm became a buzzsaw, excellent for dismantling buildings or other structures. Zeke donned heavy armor while in this form, most noticeable on his shoulders and a faceplate that he wore over his eye. Because of this heavy armor though, he walked sluggishly upon the ground. To many, Zeke is just a curious robot made by a brilliant, though somewhat clumsy engineer. However, Zeke is far more than he appears. If rumors are to be believed, this little bot actually contains within him the mind of the Great Inventor. How a man like Destruzio came to acquire the Great Inventor's brain is unknown, but it may explain Zeke's more independent behavior, for Zeke is not always with Destruzio. Sometimes the bot visits prototype factories, and is occasionally recruited by a local Vinci magistrate from one of these factories to help fight off their enemies. One of the most famous generals of the Condottieri was a siege engineer named Battaglion. General Battaglion leads a band of Condottieri known for their willingness to do the dirty work. A giant individual in his own right, Battaglion uses a siege cannon in combat. More like a handheld mortar, this weapon does great damage to buildings, but can also knock back enemy infantry units. The more familiar Battaglion became with this mortar, the greater his siege attack could be. The mortar could be loaded with a high explosive shell that does massive damage to not only buildings, but entire cities. This siege explosion could bring whole buildings crumbling to the ground, and even though it may not be strong enough to level a city, it did lower the number of infantrymen required to storm it. Battaglion's cannon could also be loaded with metallic pellets that when fired, scattered in a short but wide cone in front of him. This scatter shot was highly effective at taking out infantry units. Those that it didn't kill would be knocked back by the blast, being stunned for a few seconds. Due to the weight of the equipment he carried, Battaglion couldn't move very fast. Occasionally he would take a Timonium shot, which boosted his movement speed while also increasing his firing range and attack against buildings. During the Miana Venucci War, Battaglion would provide his services to Giacomo, who freed him from a prison where he had been locked up by one of the Doge's allies. Even after the war, Battaglion would accompany Giacomo to the Kalahisi Desert in pursuit of the Doge. When present in the field, Battaglion's engineering expertise reduced building construction and increased the attack of siege units. The most notorious individual of the Vinci was Doge Alessadri, ruler of Venucci. The Doge took power in Venucci by promising to industrialize the state, which he did. Though the people didn't realize the price they would have to pay for such progress, with the majority of them being either forced to perform hard labor in mines and factories, or join the Doge's military forces. While Doge Alessadri lacked the brilliance of other Vinci such as Giacomo, he had an impressive array of technological weapons that compensate in power for what they lack in elegance. When present on the field of battle, the Doge increases the creation of all units, and improves steam cannon, juggernaut, and units built at the glorious statue. The Doge commanded his forces from his own custom-built walker. The walker moved on four legs and had two arms. On the right arm was attached a beam weapon, which was given to the Doge by the Quaddle. This weapon was excellent against individual targets, though it lacked any area of effect damage. Because of this, 
the Doge could call it a poison cloud artillery strike upon a group of his enemies. This poison cloud spread in a wide area, causing toxic damage to any units that stood within it. This toxic fog could also affect some of the Doge's own units, with the exception of his elite guard, whose gas masks would protect them. Against individual units or heroes, the Doge could use the Quattle Beam weapon as a pain ray. The concentration of this beam of energy on a single target did incredible damage, being more than capable of instantly killing any non-hero units. Instead of causing great pain to an individual unit, the weapon could also be used as a siege laser. This attack functioned very similarly to Battaglione's siege cannon, able to instantly destroy buildings or completely shatter the defenses of a city. This would either force the targeted city to surrender or make it easier for infantry units to storm the city. The final ability the Doge had at his disposal was named after himself, the Doge's Hammer. The Hammer was a giant cannon that could fire a single artillery shell from a long distance away. When the shell landed, it would cause a great explosion, killing or significantly damaging any units caught within the blast radius. The Hammer was capable of destroying entire cities, which is what the Doge did during the war between Miana and Venucci. After destroying Miana, the Doge and his surviving military forces marched through the Cilian Pass to the Kalahisi Desert. A band of the Doge's troops abandoned him, taking shelter next to a magical oasis. This group of deserters were led by a man named Pulatore. Pulatore was a chemical expert, supposedly responsible for developing the chemical weapons the Doge uses. Pulatore's lungs were scarred from the constant exposure to corrosive materials, thus why he is seen wearing a rebreather attached to an oxygen tank. Like Destruzio, Pulatore is often seen piloting his own custom-built tank, which features gun ports at the front and two containers of corrosive toxins attached to the back. This green toxin can be seen leaking out the sides of the vehicle, which moves across the ground using continuous tracks. Unsurprisingly in combat, Pulatore used a variety of toxin-related weaponry. The first was a grenade that, when detonated, created a red cloud that covered a wide area. Anything caught within this cloud would be poisoned by it, eventually succumbing to the toxic effects if they remained within it. As the cloud disperses, however, its toxicity is weakened. Alternatively, Pulatore could trigger a poison assault on enemy units that surrounded his vehicle. This creates an aura of poison that does damage to the enemy units nearby him. This poison lingers on them even if they manage to move away from Pulatore. Pulatore could make enhancements to the guns at the bumper of his vehicle, increasing his ground attack. Lastly, Pulatore could apply a deadly poison to a single target, which damages them over a considerable time period, depending on how strong the poison was. Such an effect was often used against enemy heroes or other powerful individual units. Due to his considerable expertise in poisons, Pulatori increased the poison attack of other units and was immune to poison himself, already suffering from the toxic effects of his own concoctions. Pulatori would end up joining forces with Giacomo, who, along with his Alin allies, helped the Doge deserters defend their oasis sanctuary from attacks by the Dark Alin. With the help of his Vinci and Alin allies, Giacomo would finally take his revenge against the Doge of Venucci, as well as defeat Sawu, leader of the Dark Alin. His ventures would next take him, along with his allies, to the jungles of the Quado, where he would halt a world-ending event at the cost of his own life. Lenora, chief captain of Parada and one of Giacomo's most loyal allies, returned with the surviving Vinci to their homeland. Da Vinci had become wary of the conflicts that had long divided them, especially the most recent war between Miana and Venucci, which left none of the states untouched by the conflict. The people longed for a leader who could unite the Vinci, and Lenora stepped up to meet that challenge, hoping to unite them under the flag of a new Miana. Lenora works to build alliances among the city-states, each Vinci citizen answering to a single common law. This effort was not well received among Lenora's own Parada lieutenants, who plot against her from the shadows. However, a unified Vinci, with their combined technological and scientific intellect, would be the one thing that could resist the Alin, whose kingdom, 
now no longer under the threat of their dark glass brethren, talk of greater expansion beyond their own lands. Should such an event ever come to pass, the magics of the Alin would be fully pitted against the technological might of the Vinci, the greatest engineers of Io.